I'm uh, Gareth Edwards, and I am embarrassingly titled the Head of Knowledge and Understanding. <laughs> uh, I know, I know, I don't even bother trying to be serious about that anymore. Uh, <laughs> at the Royal Commission uh, for Wales. Uh, what, what that actually means is uh, I manage the, the half of the organisation which is not only responsible for the survey and the research and the cre creation of information but is also responsible for the archive and curating the information as well. There's another half of the organisation called Public Services which is about making that information available and engaging with people about it. But I, I work on the production and curation of information, and I too am an archivist as well, so not an archaeologist. Um, although I've worked with archaeological archives and, and in the heritage sector for most of my professional life of about 25 years, God forgive me. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk today about our approach to digital preservation. I mean, we have a lot in common with Scotland, except we're smaller. So I won't, or try not to go over what has been said in that respect. Uh, but what I want to talk about is not massively technical, it's looking at um, planning a solution for digital archives which looks at the sort of management of what we do as a whole. Uh, because I think the important thing to realise is digital archives are archives and they serve the same purpose as paper archives did, they just need to be looked after in a different way. Okay. So the NMRW archive and the National Monuments Record for Wales is the sort of information and archive service for the Royal Commission. Uh, Royal Commission has been around for over 100 years, 1908 it was set up. The NMRW uh, was set up in 1963. So, you know, over that time we've amassed a lot of analogue information, hard copy information. Millions of photographic images, drawings, pages of text, etc. Uh, but now, and this is the important thing from our point of view, and this is only five terabytes, so it pales in insignificance to Scotland. But in the same way, you know, within our organisation, there's a lot of data out there as well, several terabytes worth that needs to come through as well, and will be arriving sooner rather than later. Now, uh, like I say, that, that area is the growth area. We still get hard copy uh, records, because we don't just produce our own records, we collect them from the sector as well. But they're legacy records, and you know, the vast majority now, the tipping point has been reached a fair few years ago in that it's all produced digitally. Everything we do is produced digitally, and really when we're talking about archaeological archives, we are talking about digital archives now. If they're not digital, you know, what are you doing, basically? Uh, and the sort, you know, sort of stuff, so... And this is no different to what we used to do, you know, recording sites, except it's done digitally now. So three-dimensional recording, GPS survey, the outputs uh, from that survey are digital, you know, uh, um, uh, AutoCAD, etc., um, And sort of big blocks of data now as well with, you know, new survey techniques. So you've got things like LIDAR, some hill forts here, or uh, digital photogrammetry, structured from motion where you can create 3D models very quickly, creating masses of data that have to be looked after. Also, the kind of uh, interpreted outputs of our work. You know, we used to produce a lot of reconstruction drawings, cutaways, very well known for that. Well, this is all done dig digitally now. This is a still from an animation. Uh, you can turn it around, take it apart, put it back together again. F fulfills exactly the same function, it's just digital. And then the biggest growth area, I would say, bigger than what we produce ourselves, is what's happening in the archaeological sector especially through development control planning etc production of archaeological archives we're the national home for that and it's growing exponentially so we have to get some kind of national home for it in wales i should say uh, we have to get some kind of handle on it and manage it properly and make it available i mean that's the key thing you know as an organization our raison d'etre is to make stuff available interpret let people um, access stuff so we're not just putting it in a big box and forgetting about it it's key to us, really. So this talk is entitled Sustainability. That's you know, one of those words people say, it's got to be sustainable. What do I actually mean? Um, obviously, affordability of the solution. So there's a setup cost and ongoing costs of, of a technical solution. Now, they can be big, but I would argue that they're the easiest things to sort of sort out, really. Once you've got that money and you know how much your licensing every year is going to cost, you can uh, hopefully budget for it. The other things of sustainability, I think, are a bit more harder to pin down, and the other three things here are all interrelated. 
that continuity of practice is really important. Like I say, you know, we've built up archives over 100 years. Our raison d'etre is the same, i.e. to create a record of the historic environment, curate that and make it available. So, you know, archaeological archives have to serve that. And any um, sort of solution mustn't cut across what we do. You know, we're not in a new era of uh, we do everything digitally, therefore we're going to do it in a different way. I think it's got to serve what our purpose has always been. And because we've got well-developed systems, you know, we can't really afford to disrupt those working systems by bringing in something which totally um, tears up the rule book. So it has to serve our existing systems. And those, those things are all underpinned by this. It's got to be supportable by the staff we've got. Um, this sort of work, digital preservation, can be very, very labor intensive, actually. Uh, and we have a very small staff. The Royal Commission has about 30 odd staff, of which, and you saw the size of the archive we've got, of which you've got about one and a half staff on a daily basis working on sort of cataloguing and curation. So it's a small staff. And, you know, the sort of political and financial situation being what it is, that's <laughs> unlikely to change. We're unlikely to be taking on staff complement, except through smaller funded projects, etc. They are supported by people, you know, um, sort of in training or people volunteering. So we do get extra pairs of hands like that. But anything we do has to be supportable by a very small staff complement. And that's not going to change. And I think that's true for everyone, really, especially after uh, yesterday's news. Um, so with that in mind, let's have a look at our friend, the OAIS model. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. <laughs> we, this is the uh, what, Open Archival Information System. This is, what we un this is a very simplified version of it. It's what we undertake to comply with in looking after digital records, OK? And this isn't a standard that says what um, format of record you should be using. It's not saying, you know, how uh, archives should be ordered. It's a, it's a set of kind of, it's a management model for how you should be managing information. And the key things that I'm going to talk about, really, if we go through, and this is in bold, these information packages that move through the system. So your submission information package, and remember that, that's in bold because this is key to our approach. That's what we get from the producer. Now that pr producer may work in our organization or it may be a contract archeologist or someone in the university, etc. cetera, okay? And it moves through this system. Now this isn't a straight in and out. This is an iterative process here. And this is where the more labor intensive sort of preservation things happen. So things have to be um, planned. They have to be migrated to new formats where necessary. They have to be checked to make sure they're not decaying, that kind of thing. Okay. So the archival information package takes the information packages are the data, the sort of structure of that data, and then the metadata that's wrapped around them. Yeah. So it's the archive in its fullest sense, and it moves through the system, and we add archival information for preservation purposes and descriptive purposes. And that's iterative. As things need to be migrated, as they're checked and need to be copied, that gets added. So it's, it's not a simple move through. Then you've got your DIP, your dissem d dissemination information package. This is what we supply to people using the records, right? This is what we put out the other end. So you know, without that, there's no point in doing any of the other stuff. It's got to be reusable. Otherwise, why are we doing it? But, as I've said, it all depends on what we get in the first instance. And I'll come on to talk about this in a minute. That's key to having a sustainable system. I've got a terrible cold, so I apologise to the people in the front row especially. But I need to wipe my nose, I'm sorry. Right, so, how are we undertaking to comply with that? Well, it's a work in progress. As, as, as we just heard, you know, we're trying to make things better, but we're not there yet. So th this is where we're at at the moment, right? I don't want to get too technical here, but we've got our, our data systems are in fact <coughs> generated through a partnership with Scotland, with the Royal Commission as well as now HES. And um, they're quite complex data relationships and they're well developed and they, they're useful. So we don't want to disrupt them, we want to keep them as far as we possibly can. So at the moment you've got an archive catalogue there and that deals with hard copy and digital data alike. And it's uh, ISAG compliant, which is uh, an archival descriptive standard. Um, <coughs> and it's also then linked to loads of other tables like site data, 
person information, that kind of thing, to create an archive catalog which is indexed geographically to sites. Okay, so you've got some complex uh, uh, data relationships and different tables there that we want to keep because you know they work, frankly. Um, and then where a, an item is digital, either born digital or digitized, we have what we call a digital instance table that captures the sort of technical metadata. So the size of the file, the format, etc., all the stuff we need to record. Um, and uh, it also has the path to where the file sits on the archive server, which is back in Scotland. Yeah, still up, isn't it? Still up. Um, <laughs> Is that up? Is that Scotland up there? I don't know. I don't know where we are. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so that's doing some of the management, okay? And aggregating that together as a web service, we can then push this out, okay, to Covlane, which is how our users can access the information. So they can search our site data, they can search the relevant archives that relate to that site, or they can go and just search the archives directly if they want. Uh, and where they're actually digital or digitized, they can get a screen version of that record as well, if it's consumable as a screen version. So it could be a PDF of a plan, it could be a report, it could be just a photograph. A bit more complex with those big data sets I was talking about, like LiDAR, etc. But it's searchable and consumable uh, through Covlane by our users. So we're, we're complying with some of that model. We'll go back and have a look at that model in a minute. But where it's falling down is the, that process I was talking about of active preservation. We need to do that as, uh, automate in, as automated a way as possible because we don't have the staff complement to do it by hand, basically. So what we need to do is augment this infographic coming up. Oh, hold on. Where we go? Here we go. Boom. Bang. So, so that sort of archive package we need to slip that in somewhere. And, and, you know, like the Preservica stuff that Scotland are looking at, we're considering that. But there are other uh, op, um, uh, uh, types of things like uh, Archivematica that we might look at as well. We've been seriously considering the Preservica one, but we've kind of got a year's hiatus from our, um, our sort of uh, uh, data partnership at the moment with HES being created, etc. So we're looking at our options here. But whatever package we choose, we need to augment that in the same relationship. So that will allow us to you know, create the technical metadata we need, do the preservation planning and those active preservation actions, uh, and automate them as far as possible with our existing staff complement. And it will still allow us to output to our users in the same manner. So we're not you know, tearing things apart and doing things completely different, radically different for digital archives. We're augmenting our systems as they are for the special needs of the digital uh, aspects of our records. That's the idea. So if we then look at our compliance with the OAIS model, if we do that, it's time. Okay. Um, we got preservation planning taken care of uh, if, we, if we adopt that. We've got the ability to output that stuff to consumers. So we're taking care of that. But the bit that's, that's the weak point, I think, is this. Okay, this is the key bit. The interface between the producer and the custodian. Now, where we're producing our own records within the commission, that's easy, especially since I manage the, <laughs> the people who produce it and the archive. I can say, do it like this, right? And they've got to. And we can get the planning. You know, we've got big um, European-funded uh, project coming up called Cherish uh, with uh, the Irish Republic, looking at sites uh, on the coast around the Irish Sea and islands. Okay, that's going to produce a lot. I can get embedded into that how we want the stuff presented to us, for instance. But where it falls down, obviously, is the biggest producer of data that's coming into us are organisations outside of the Commission. So, you know, um, archaeological units, the archaeological trust in Wales, people like that. So, in order for us to make this as sustainable as possible, we, we cannot do a lot of work on the submission information package. Okay, we don't have the people. We can't turn that into something that could be ingested. Speaking from personal experience, it's the ingest phase that has the biggest amount of work if it's not presented to you in a, as usable way as possible. So that is where we're focusing our work. So I'll do this quickly because I'm running out of time. Uh, and this is why we're trying to establish control with the producers using these guidelines. 
um, they basically uh, set out a structured approach to organizing records, specify the mandatory me metadata elements we need, and the preferred formats of digital file. This is an important aspect, but it's not the be-all and end-all, although it's what people want to talk about the most for some reason. Um, and it, it, it sets out, you know, general um, ideas about how things should be structured with some rules. Um, gives metadata for pro formas for the different areas of metadata we require, so including the sort of top level archive information, individual file information, and technical documentation where that's required. And these are the sort of examples of the pro formas. Technical documentation is documentation about metadata, basically. Um, information about items or groups uh, which, the, which enable the data to be understood and reused by others, that's, that's key. Um, and it's about that, that end bit. You know, if you can't reuse the stuff, there's no point in looking after it, really. And we also have um, a, a set of preferred formats as well, although they're not, that's not exhaustive. I'm doing this quickly because I'm running out of time. OK, uh, the key thing about this, obviously, is we're to, I'm, I can crack the whip with people uh, who I manage. <laughs> I can't do it with people outside the organization. So what we're doing is trying to make it part mandatory part of the planning and development control regime. You know, if, they, if, if, if contractors are told they have to do it, they will do it because they want the contract. Um, it's, we've got national standards uh, for uh, archaeological archives in Wales that have just been published. It's included as an appendix in that. Uh, and we're doing a lot of training events and promotion with these um, guidelines as well. And that's it. Thank you very much.